you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. Oh, my God. It's like 700 plus podcasts on the Chris Voss Show. So if you're sitting around during this holiday season you know, or after, for that matter, uh, the big old t- 2021, uh, take in, go back and listen to some of those great episodes. We're doing kind of a look back on the year. We had just the most brilliant authors. We only have brilliant offers on the show. When we reach out to people, we are like, are you a brilliant author? And they go, yes, I am. And we go, okay, well, then we're going to put you on the show. So go back and listen to all those wonderful authors, book authors that we had on the show. You go to Goodreads dot com for slash chris voss and see our books that we're reading reviews and different people we've had on the show as well uh you can go to facebook.com for slash the chris voss show and see it over there uh also you can go to youtube.com for slash chris voss and see some of the interviews we've done and uh i think that's about it you can go to facebook and linkedin there's giant groups over there for the chris voss show you can just search and follow them and this episode is brought to you by ifi audio and their new neo IDSD. The Neo is the new wave of digital sound listening for your desktop, music, gaming, and bleeding edge Bluetooth, even MQA audio file decoding. Uh, we're using it in the studio right now. I've loved my experience with it so far. It just makes everything sound so much more richer and better and takes things to the next level. IFI Audio is an award winning audio tech company with one aim in mind to improve your music enjoyment of quality sound, eradicate noise distortion and hiss from your listening experience check out their new incredible lineup of dax and audio enhancement devices at ifi-audio.com today we have a most brilliant author he's the author of uh, i believe six books so he's very prolific Uh, i'm still working on my first one so this guy's got something going on and we'll find out what it is his name is jeffrey s stevens and his latest book that has just come out is called fool's errand uh kind of like i think it's the story of my life maybe i don't know we'll, we'll get into the details of what the book is so anyway let's talk more about what jeffrey is we'll give you a bio rundown on him he was born in new york city and graduated from the bronx high school of science at the age of 16 he completed a ba in creative writing from pennsylvania state university at 19 jeffrey began his first novel in 1970 which would not be completed for several years as he entered the fordham university school of law his private legal practice has included extensive civil and criminal courtroom experience and he's represented a wide range of celebrity clients continuing to practice law while completing several novels he only recently decided to pursue his career as a novelist in earnest with the encouragement of his wife nancy a welcome to the show jeffrey how are you thank you i'm good how are you doing Good, 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 good. It's wonderful to have you on. Uh, author of six novels, man. You're you're pretty prolific at this point, right? Well, at this point, I am. <laughs> As you said, for many years, I was not. But I'm, I'm working on it, yeah. There you go. So give us your plugs, Jeffrey, where people can look you up on the interwebs, get to know you better, and order up your book. Okay, thanks. Well, to start with, the new book, as you say, is Fool's Errand. This is my personal favorite in terms of being a, a personal book. Uh, it's obviously available on Amazon, Fool's Aaron, Jeffrey Stevens, Stevens with a PH. And in your local bookstores, I like to support independent bookstores. They may not have it in, but they can order it for you. And um, the book that was out just before that, maybe we'll talk about that later, was Crimes and Passion, which was a different story. But as you say, yes, if I could jump ahead, I'll just say I've got six books that are out there. The first four are spy series about one particular character. And then I wanted to go in slightly different directions. So I did a murder mystery and that was crimes and passion. And now I've done fool's errand. And as I say, that's more of a personal story, which we could get into. There you go. Well, let's get into it. What motivated you to write fool's errand, this new book? Well, I'll give you, let me start with the serious answer because it's a fun book, but I'll give you the serious answer. My dad died when he was 50. I was 22 um, I love my dad. Many of us love our parents, but he was a flawed individual. And 
the fact that he died so many years ago and so young has not put an end to his influence on my life. And I became fascinated with the concept of how much parents influence us even when they're gone. And I know that may sound really trite and your you know, listeners may say, God, who is this guy, an idiot? I mean, of course your parents are important, but I mean, they really do have mm-hmm. impact far beyond their days. And the book at the very beginning, the, the quote that I used was from the famous editor, Maxwell Perkins. He was the editor for Hemingway and Fitzgerald and that crew. He said that every good deed a man does is to please his father. So I thought, be very interesting. You know, my dad's gone for so long. What if I heard from him again somehow? Hmm. And so the plot device I came up with, and I'm not, this is not a spoiler alert necessary because it's right at the beginning of the book, that six years after this character dies, the father, the main character, the narrator of the book, finds a box of papers that his father left behind in the attic. And in it is a letter that he wrote to this son just before he died. And basically, it talks of basically money, a treasure, and and this sends the son off on a treasure hunt. So the father was a ne'er do well. He was on the fringes of organized crime. He was sort of a New York City mobster type guy, but not a big time mobster, a small time guy. You know, we see the Godfather and Goodfellas and all these people making a lot of money, but the underpinnings of the underworld are a bunch of of uh, guys who are out there not making much money and not doing much good. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Well, so, mafia soldiers, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So in any in any case, so I thought, wouldn't it be fun to have this guy find this letter? And he's a straight shooter. He's not at all like his dad. He's, you know, a 30-ish, you know, account executive, work-a-day world in New York, kind of even a little bit of a dull guy. And now he gets this letter, and so he has a choice. He could put the letter back in the envelope and said, ah, oh, that dad was always looking for, you know, the brass ring. Or... He could say, gee, maybe there's something to this. And we know what he does, which is why the book is called Fool's Errand. And he embarks on what becomes a treasure hunt for this money. And along the way, others, his father's former cohorts, learn that there's been a development with respect to this money that he knew nothing about, the son knew nothing about. And so he gets involved with them and he gets involved with his father's former friends. And he winds up going from New York to see his father's best friend in Las Vegas and ultimately winds up of all places in the south of France, because the money had something to do with his father's days and and when he was in the service and so on. Mm -hmm. And so it's fun. It's romantic. It's a father son story. It's about the impact that parents have on us. It's about someone reaching out from the great beyond and you don't expect to hear from them. And that's basically the story. So that's what inspired me to write the book. Long, long winded answer, but that's, that's the answer. That's awesome. I mean, I it is interesting the effect that uh, our parents have on us. I mean, even people that don't grow up with their parents, maybe their parents pass away at an early age, uh, like yours did, or or, or abandoned or different things. Um, I've always been kind of fascinated by a lot of CEOs and people that that became really successful, and either their parents le- their 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 father left at a young age, or or passed away at a very young age. Um, but yeah, it, it is interesting. So what are some of the characters in the book and what are they up to? Yeah, and I'll answer that. But I just want to go on with what you're saying, because it's so true that there's no formula. You know, when I have children and there was no guidebook, there's no instruction manual how to do this right. So there are people, as you say, whose father died when they were five and they grow up to be these massively successful people. And then there are people who have these very loving, nurturing parents and they grow up to be complete schmucks. I mean, <laughs> so so that, you, know, you, don't, you don't know how it's going to impact you. Yeah. You know, my dad, his his sort of his his parenting it was very funny because I talked with my mother about this years after he was gone. His parenting philosophy was I'm going to push him and make him as angry as possible because that's how he's going to be successful because he's going to want to show me. I thought, gee, you know, it would have been nice a little armor, you know, a little armor on the shoulders would have been nice, but that was his view of the world. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so the characters in the book, getting to your question, there's obviously Blackie who becomes the centerpiece of this. And you know, from the beginning that he's dead, but there are a lot of flashbacks to what happened during his life and his relationship with his son. Mm -hmm. And then there's his best friend. And then there's a young woman that our narrator meets along his journey on this treasure hunt. And we don't know, is she, is she good? Is she bad? Does she have evil intent? Is she sincere? We don't know that really until the end. And mm-hmm. then there ultimately is this guy in the south of France who solves the mystery for a, for a narrator 
who was a very good friend during the war with this narrator's father and the narrator's and the father's best friend. So that's where it all kind of ties together. So this is, I, I don't want to compare myself to Dickens, but it's kind of Dickensian in the fact that all these threads kind of come together at the end, along with the bad guys chasing him down, the answer to what the money was and what happens to it and what happens to our guy. So it's, it's I, I hate the expression coming of age novel, because that's not what it is, but it's really about a young man growing up under the influence of a father who's long gone which I thought was kind of a, a fun, a fun way to approach this. So it sounds like he finds a lot about his father as he goes and probably some about himself. That's you, you hit the nail on the head. He finds a lot about his father. He didn't know, and he learns to man up. And, uh, and so that's what it is. And it's really, you know, I hope that when people read it, that they'll laugh and they'll cry and they'll be entertained because that's, that's, that's the point. And I was talking to, uh, a gentleman in a radio interview and we were talking about this and he said, you know, it's funny you say this because it really touches me because my dad died when I was 20. That's what he said. And he said, and yet to this day, all these years later, when I do something, I think, God, my father would have liked that or, you know, or my father wouldn't have been too proud of me if I did this. So, you know, and mothers and daughters and mothers and sons and fathers and daughters, it's, it's really complicated and it's what makes the fabric of life so fascinating, I think. My dad was a tough dad, and you know? it's really re interesting that I remember the exact moment in time, like it's the most clear thing that I have in my relationship with my father, and when he told me he was proud of me, it was the you know first and and uh, might have been the last. I don't know. <laughs> I was that good of a kid, but I think I was thirty five. <laughs> but but yeah, it was uh, he was a tough guy, and and I and I realize now looking back, he was trying to. I think a lot of fathers do this; they're trying to toughen you up for the world because yep. they know the world is tough. And this, you know, mom will coddle you, and you know, you fall and skin your knee, and you know, she's like, hey, you know. Um, so you, um, so does uh, is there some mafia in this story where some of the oh, bad yeah. guys that come into it, or maybe his old compadres, or oh yes, on the, oh, yes, uh, his old yeah. friends, his old friends show up, and you know, they're trying to chase down the son because they know that the son is going after this money mm. that 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 the that the son is chasing that Blackie was behind. But yeah, it's interesting what you said, by the way, my dad was the same deal. I mean, for him to say he was proud of me, forget it. And I'll, I'll tell you, I got to tell you one, if, if you don't mind, I think, I think of this as a funny story and I'm sort of making fun of myself, but my father was the kind of guy, like he never came and watched me play ball. I mean, when I grew up, oh, I was wow. in the Bronx and we, you know, we did sandlot kind of, kind of stuff, you know, and this was not like these fancy fields that the kids play on and they get uniforms and everything. We had nothing. We were lucky we had a baseball. So this one day, he came to see me play ball. And I was a scrawny little kid. I was all field, no hit. You know, when the kid, I was a kid that always played second base, you know, you get the picture. So anyway, so I'm up at bat and I see him there and he's in these like makeshift kind of stands, you know, these bleacher type stands off to the side. And I get up, I'm so excited that he's here and I line this shot to right field. And I'm so excited that as I'm running down first base, I keep looking to see, you know, did he see this? Was he watching when this happened? And the right fielder threw me out at first. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yes. oh, no. It was a great line drive, one hopper, and he just saw me, like, you know, dragging down the dragging down the first baseline looking for my father. I got thrown out. So, of course, did my father say, ah, oh, that's too bad? So, no, he told me I was a jerk and, you know, <laughs> and made fun of me for it. So uh, <laughs> these are the things that toughen us up in life, Chris. That's how it goes. The lessons we learn sometimes. Yeah. But yes, there are mobsters getting back to this. And so I, I think part of the fun of the book, because it's a fast read, is that there's fun stuff in there. There's there's the guy and Blackie and his son and those flashbacks. There's the son and his friends. There's Blackie's friends. But there are also these bad guys. So there's danger involved. And we get to see some interesting uh, different uh, settings in, as I say, in New York City and Las Vegas and then in, in the south of France, uh, in, uh, you know, in Monaco and in uh, you know, Saint Paul de Vence and places like that. So I was like that. I, I'm a guy, by the way, in, in my writing in general, I like to go to different places. I think that's fun for readers. I mean, once in a while, like my murder mystery, Crimes and Passion, that all takes place in one town. It's very, very I don't want to say claustrophobic, but it's intended to be tight. You know, it's all about a murder mystery that happens in a suburban town. But generally, like my spy novels, they're all globetrotters. I, I like when the guy's going all over the place. I think it's fun. People get to see things that they maybe haven't gotten to and hear about them and like that. And they give the description of the different uh, 
you know, it, it paints different pictures and you get to go to different places. Uh, so you grew up in the Bronx. Was there uh, some influence that came to the mafia figures in your book and the experience there from what oh, sure. from real life? Oh, yeah. I mean, you might have met a few people in the Bronx. <laughs> yes, I met a few. <laughs> there were a few guys yeah, along the way. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm a real believer that, first of all, that readers today are so sophisticated and so intelligent that you can't fool them. So if you write things, if you write about things you don't know about or places you haven't been, forget it. You're not, you're not going to fool anybody. So I always write about what I know. And the Bronx was, it was an interesting place in those days. Uh, it wasn't, it's, it's strange to say it wasn't as dangerous as it is now. I don't think, Um, you know, you didn't get shot in the street. You got beat up pretty good. I mean, that, you know, that would happen. And you learned, you know, as Billy Joel said, uh, I lost a lot of fights, but it taught me how to lose. Okay. You know, so I got kicked around. Okay. But nobody was shooting anybody. You know, it was just a different time, Chris. And, you know, we played ball in the streets until it was dark. And then, you know, we went into our apartment buildings and we came out the next day and did the same thing again. And that was just life. And everybody was equally poor. And so you didn't feel poor because nobody had a whole lot more than you did. And there were these characters who drove the fancy cars and wore, you know, the flashy suits and the ugly ties. And you knew who they were, you know, when they came to, you know, collect protection money from the local bars and stuff. And, and so that was that was just life. And it just hummed along. Blacks and whites got together. I mean, I lived right next to a, uh, a development that we used to call in the Bronx. I don't know what they call it nowadays, but they called them projects. And what the projects were, they were these government created housing. You know, it was, quote, low income housing uh, with, you know, built by architects who had the imagination of a gnat because they looked like, you know, they looked really like prisons yeah. more than anything. But, you know, the, we went to school with those black kids. We played ball with them. It, there was no big, you know, there was no big racial divide like there is today. You know, mm-hmm. that just wasn't it. You know, wow. I mean, it was just a different time. And so. It wasn't as scary. And I've gone back to visit my old neighborhood. I live up in Connecticut now, but I I go back to visit my old neighborhood. And it's really it's 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 pretty grim at times. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame because it's a different world. Yeah. Some of those areas just have gotten worse. And oh, man, the redlining of mortgages and everything else. So you you left your law practice to to write books. So this has been pretty good for you then. Yeah, I've been very fortunate. I represented a lot of great people in my career, some not so great, but I didn't do much criminal work. I started off thinking I might be a criminal defense attorney because obviously the influence of my dad, you know, is evident there again. But what I found, what I found early on, and I know this is going to be another one of these brilliant observations, is that if you have a criminal defense practice, you have to generally represent criminals because otherwise you're not going to be busy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and most of them, and this is going to come as a terrible flash to the bar. I mean, the, the American Bar Association will hate this, but you know, most of them turn out to be guilty. And so your job is, really? your job is to keep them out of jail, but they didn't get arrested for nothing. I mean, police are not crazy, right? I mean, you, know, yeah. <laughs> you arrest a guy in a shooting or, or for bookmaking or for, you know, for dealing drugs. So these were not great people. So very early in my practice, I made because I, I was a sole practitioner. I worked my way through co- through law school, and then I opened up an office. And early on, I made the decision that you have to conclude who you want to spend your life with, mm-hmm. and your clients tend to become friends. And I said, "Do I really want to be hanging out with these people?" <laughs> no. So I left New York. I went up to Connecticut, and I built a business practice that was more geared towards you know uh, civil litigation and and uh, real estate and different things. And along the way. One story that people like to hear is I met a woman at a party and we became friendly through another friend of mine. My wife and I became friendly with her and her husband, and she was a caterer. And she had this idea about publishing a magazine. And her husband and she came to me and said, we'd be interested if you'd like to represent her. And so I said, sure, that sounds like fun. And so Martha and I uh, did a lot of work together and ultimately created Martha Stewart Living the magazine oh, wow. and the TV show. And I did all of that for her. I did the deal at when she went with time Warner, we got her on the today show. We got her television program going. Nice. And that was a big part of my life for a lot of years. And she was a fascinating, fascinating person. She always seems really nice. I always, I always, I, I see the uh, relationship she has with uh, who's that rapper. I'm, yeah, I'm, Snoop Dogg. 
yeah i'm not a big rapper fan i'm a metallic no. old, old rock dude you know it's it's good music but i'm just not it's, uh, it's not my thing i'm just it's old not, <laughs> yeah not my so, thing hey I like the Beatles, Beatles and Billy Joel. And yeah, Paul you and Simon. me. You know, we're big <laughs> Billy Joel fans. Yeah, the Beatles. Um, but uh, um, but yeah, I mean, she always seems really nice, but I think it's fun. I always see like videos of the two of them doing stuff, and I think she's just a hoot. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of corny. I will say this, and just, you know, for the men and women in your, in your audience, there was a long time that I was representing her that people had a lot of negative things to say about yeah. her, and my response is always the same. If Martha had been a man and doing all this, everyone would have said, what a tough guy. Isn't he terrific? Yeah. Isn't he a go getter? And you know what they called her as a woman. And so, yeah. you know, you, you talk about sexism. That's real sexism. Yeah. And she really is a driven person. She's incredibly smart. She's incredibly talented. And is she tough? Tough as nails, Chris. Tough yeah. as nails. And you know what? Good for her. Good for her. I mean, I, I, I see her cooking and stuff. In fact, I saw a lot of, you know, we had a lot of off time with the quarantine. So I would see her Instagram posts of what she was cooking and doing different things. And, and she just, she just always seems nice. I'll, I'll eat whatever she makes. Oh, uh, I see. Listen, I follow her on Instagram and if I ate everything she makes, I'd, I'd weigh 400 pounds. <laughs> she, has, she has no mercy. <laughs> she has no mercy pies and cakes and cookies. Oh my God. Yeah. There's one other, there's one other chef and we're kind of off topic, but I'll just throw it in here real quick. That's quite one other right. chef, I think it's the barefoot Contessa. I think it is or something. And she makes like everything with butter. Like, it's like, okay, if starting out, throw in five pounds of butter and that's just awful. So, um, oh, wait, wanna... wait, back up for a second, because that's what, what Julia child, who I met through Martha, by the way, not, I'm not trying to throw oh, really? names around, but Julia was on Martha's show. And, you know, the famous line is, what's the secret to French cooking? Butter, butter, and more butter. <laughs> right? so, <laughs> well, the Barefoot wrong. Contessa, that's not Ina Garner, is it? That's the two. I, I'm not sure. I don't know her name. I always uh, see her I, show. I, I, and I start watching it, and my cholesterol goes up just watching the show. <laughs> and uh, I have to turn it off because... Oh. It's true. Oh, my God. heart starts palpitating a little bit. <laughs> like the food looks great, but I'm just like watching her throwing the ingredients. And she's like, yeah, pound butter there and just throw in some butter. And oh, I'm like, I'm sure God. that tastes great, but it'll be my last meal. Anyway, yeah, exactly. Uh, anything more you want to plug about the book? If you want to talk about the other books, let's talk about those two. And get well, I, I, I just want to say that, you know, God, I wish everyone would buy full Zern because I think it's, it's a fun, touching and, and, and entertaining book. And before that, they, they kind of came out one after the other this time, which, you know, isn't always the best thing. But uh, the other book is Crimes and Passion, which is completely different. It's a murder mystery. And again, available on Amazon and your local bookstores and all that stuff. And uh, Crimes and Passion is is a totally different thing. You mind if I talk about that for a minute? Go ahead. Let's play. Okay. So, so the we'll get people to buy all your books. Yeah. The reason the reason about, for Crimes and Passion was it was a time in my life when it seemed that everybody we knew, my wife and I knew, were getting divorced. Everyone was getting divorced. And I really wanted to write something about that. And I thought, God, would that be depressing? I mean, who the heck wants to read that? It's bad enough they're all getting divorced. Who the hell wants to read about it? So I decided, what do people like to read? They like to read murder mysteries. So I felt that if I could wrap the divorces around a murder mystery, that would work. So this is another book where, <laughs> where the inciting incident happens right at the beginning, which is, a woman is murdered right at the beginning of the book. And we learn that she was married. She was a sexual predator. And she was keeping a journal of her various exploits of all the men in town that she was sleeping with. Oh, wow. And so now, as the police detective who's involved in this has to sort this out, he realizes that any one of those men is a likely candidate for having committed the murder. And the person most likely to help him solve it is the therapist who was seeing this woman because this woman was in a group therapy thing where she was getting information from the other women and seducing their husbands. <laughs> nice girl, right? <laughs> oh my God, that's anyway. Wow, that's so, brilliant. Yeah, so thank she you. She finds so, out who's having bad marriages and then yeah, so she so goes that, and, uh, Exactly right. So, she goes <laughs> with so, so we get to look at what makes marriages work and fail. And at the same time, there's a murder mystery with mounting tension because whoever committed this murder might be likely to kill this woman therapist. And of course, mm -hmm. then we've got the, the detective wanting to protect her and like that. So, so that's crimes and passion. And that's an entertaining murder mystery. And that's intended. I'm going to bring that detective back in, an, in another book that I finished that we're going to get published hopefully next year. And uh, so that's that Robbie White is his name. And he's really 
you know, he's a hard edged former New York City police detective who then moved into the suburbs. And so that's enough about that. But so that's Crimes and Passion. And so that was a fun book to write. And uh, it helped me look at some of those issues along the way. So I don't want to make it sound like it's a big, serious tone. To the contrary, it's, yeah. it's a murder mystery. Yeah, uh, that sounds like fun. In fact, I note to self, go to men's divorce help groups to pick up chicks. <laughs> Not a bit. You know something? Not a bad thought. I mean, I didn't Not a bad that. thought. I love the idea. Way, but, yeah. I'm a, I'm a single guy and I ain't getting married, but oh, I've always, go. I've always wanted, if I ever went to law school, cause I, I love law and the whole complexity of it. If I ever went to law school and I, I kicked myself uh, for not going, but uh, I would be a divorce attorney. Cause that just seems like so much fun to me. Like, <laughs> You know. it can, it, it, I've done enough divorces <laughs> to say it can be a it can be a little stressful. People are not at their best, you know. Yeah, you I know, probably would take some payment in kind, even though it's illegal, from what I understand. But you know what I mean. There's all that side. <laughs> they have to be a little careful about fiddling around with clients. Yeah, but yeah. Div divorces <laughs> and funerals, people are not necessarily at their best, and so I don't know that it's all that much fun. Anyway, that's what know. the judge told me. Anyway, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there so, you go. Let's plug those other books. Oh, my other books, that's that's a series of spy thrillers, uh, and it started with Targets of Deception, and the last one is Rogue Mission. And that's kind of that's kind of an interesting background because I wrote the, the first one, not, never expecting to write more than one, because I had a friend who was with the CIA, mm. and I thought it would be fun to write a book about that, so it was kind of like an unconventional spy book. It wasn't your normal thing in the beginning, because in the beginning... The characters pretending not to be a, um, not to be a. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. He's calling you right now. He yeah, knows you're talking you about. Not to be a, a spy. He's you know. So in any event, so uh, they liked it so much that they published it, and then Simon and Schuster said, you know, give us some more of these, and so that's how I, I wound up writing four. But four was enough, and then I moved on to other things. But they're exciting. They're uh, you know we've got a potential film deal on those oh. uh, with this character Jordan Sandor, and um, it, you know hopefully something comes of that because the movie would be great, and then then I would write more of them. But for now, I'm just going in different directions. There you go. So as the the four, is it the, the same sort of theme and character through those four? Same character, all different stories. It's targets mm -hmm. of deception, targets of revenge, targets of opportunity. And and Rogue Mission is the last one. But there the reason, go. by the way, the reason for the last name is readers were writing in and saying, I read these, but they're all called Targets. I can't remember which one I read. So the publisher said, you know, maybe we should give up on this Target stuff and just give me another title. So we went with Rogue Mission. So that was the outlier. Well, there you go. And let me pull those up. Do we have all the titles on them? Do you want to uh, read off all the titles uh, on, on all of them? Sure. It's, uh, the first one was tar you don't have to read them in order, by the way. But okay. the first one is Targets of Deception. Then we did Targets of Opportunity. That was the second. Then Targets of Revenge, which picked up on some things that happened in Targets of Opportunity. And then Rogue Mission was the most recent. There you and go. we've got another one in the can, but we ha we're not publishing it yet. We're going to see what's going to happen with, with you know, movies and all that stuff. So we shall see. You guys got to buy this book before you get the next one. That's how it works. So go yeah, out and buy yeah, Fool's Errand. You got to buy Fool's Errand. That's the thing. The world's, the world's got to buy Fool's Errand and help me out here because, you know, it's tough. This is a tough racket selling books, as you know. Our, our podcast works the same way. We can't do too many podcasts. So you have to wait for the downloads to all happen. Right. If you overfill the downloader, it doesn't it doesn't distribute them over well. So you got to feed them. So uh, everyone should go check out uh, Jeffrey's books, Fools, Aaron. Anything more uh, we should know about any of your stuff, Jeffrey, or what you're doing? Uh, only that Fools, Aaron will be one of the great reads that you'll have this year. <laughs> there you go. There That's you go. It. But, but be... I really encourage people, if, if they're kind enough to want to buy it, you know, going to an independent bookstore is great, even Barnes & Noble. But independent bookstores particularly need the business. And so give them the chance to order the book for you if they can. And if not, you could just get it overnight from uh, from Amazon. It's there. And we're three days away from the end of the year. So it might be the great greatest first read that you'll do in 2021. That's what I'm saying. There you go. <laughs> in the new year, this is going to be the good one. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we got the plugs in for your website? Do you want to plug that? Yeah, it's uh, it's www, obviously, jeffreystevens.com. Stevens with a PH. That's the one thing where people get a little ginchy looking for it, but it's jeffreystevens.com. Um, if you go to Amazon and look me up, all the books will come up and you can see my bio and all that and see all the good reviews that we've gotten for it. 
And one thing that's really nice, I must say, is because the book's only out a couple of weeks now. This is kind of a brand new release. And a lot of reviews are coming out now, and they're very, very favorable. And I must say, I'm very gratified that there's been a string of them from female reviewers. And again, I shouldn't make the distinction, but sometimes, you know, people say, well, this is a book about a father and a son, but it's also a fun mystery. It's got a great romance to it. And women are really reacting positively to the book. So that's been nice. Women are great book readers. They, they There's much more so than men. Stuff. Much yeah, more, they're more, they're more cerebral than we are um, yeah. as men. We we just like clubbing stuff and things like yeah, that. Yeah, guys want to know what the body count is and how much sex you can have in the book. I mean, <laughs> are there fast cars in the book? <laughs> anyway, guys, thank you. I've had people I've had people write to me and say about about the Jordan Sanders series about I can't believe I had a I had a read to 100 page 120 for the first sex, you know. <laughs> the book is well, you know, it is a spy thriller. It's not yeah, a it's porn not a novel. Romance novel. That's why we don't have a lot of romance novelists on the show. I mean, I love them. They're wonderful people. They write great books, but I just can't, I just can't do an interview where every other question is like, so they had sex on the beach again <laughs> and again, wait, how many times do they have sex? On the, you know, yeah. You know, didn't that sand get kind of like, uh, never mind. <laughs> I, don't know. I just, I don't know. You know, bad image. I'm just a bad romantic anyway. So I, I don't know that I'm the professional interview romance authors. So uh, it's been wonderful to have on the show, Jeffrey. Thank you for coming Thank on you. with us and spending some time with us. Uh, thanks, Thank Bonnie. You. Thank you. And uh, happy new year to everybody. I hope 2021 is a lot better than 2020. Uh, you know, we're kind of in the bottom, so it's, it's, hopefully it's all up from here that, or we're going to be just, uh, traveling the wasteland, finding zombies. <laughs> up, right. <laughs> thank you, Chris. This is fun. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful to have you, Jeffrey. And to my audience, thank you for tuning in. Be sure to check out Jeffrey's, uh, book, Fool's Errand. You can find it at your local booksellers. Uh, order it up. Support those local booksellers. Everyone's struggling right now with COVID, and we know Jeff Bezos has got enough money, but if you need to order it from Amazon, you can there as well. Uh, go see all of the uh, links that we have for me at Facebook.com, The Chris Voss Show. Uh, you can go to Goodreads.com, forward slash Chris Voss, YouTube.com, uh, the or YouTube.com, uh, forward slash Chris Voss. Uh, one of these days, I'll get it. Uh, there's over 700 episodes, and we don't have a lot of uh, interviews that have been going on over Christmas. I guess a lot of authors didn't want to take the two weeks off. So go back and listen to all the great interviews we've had. We've had so many great interviews, so many life-changing things that we had happen uh, on all the interviews we did. So go back and listen to those. Uh, there's just some wonderful things. You can go back and search them on the Chris Foss show and all that sort of good stuff. Thanks to my audience for tuning in. Thanks for everyone for being here. We'll see you guys next time.